Tonight's guest is a poet. Please welcome Sean Whelan. Yeah. Thank you. There we go. How are you doing, Sean? You having a nice time? I'm excellent. Thank Can you I for asking. Can I congratulate you, honestly? I've, I've talked before about the fact that I love the fact that this shirt matches this desk ah. and your shirt matches the background very Isn't well. Isn't that amazing? I feel I'm very glad to accommodate. This perfect. is one of my favourite shirts. Possibly my favourite shirt, actually. Yeah. Are Although all... they're kind of like my children. I, I hate to have favourites. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, are all poets incredibly fashionable? Is that our standard? Oh, no, not at all. Really? No, no it's I think it's more of a rarity. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Now, when you were growing up, uh, what kind of lawyer did your parents want you to be? Uh, <laughs> was that I, just you or was that... Because uh, that happened to me. My parents right. would have loved me to go into commercial law. Uh, no, no, there was, there was none of that. I actually wanted to be a helicopter pilot when I was a kid. For oh, some really? weird reason. Yeah. Oh, that's not weird at all. I would love to be a helicopter yeah. pilot. That didn't quite pan out. No. Well, fair enough. I feel yeah. like poetry is a little safer. Um, and in some regards. <laughs> yeah. And was there something in particular that, that pulled you into it initially? Uh, I was very fascinated by uh, novelists, actually. I really liked um, the, the, the dirty realist, who at least a sort of American school of writing, which is very clear, concise prose. But I also loved the magical realists of sort of uh, South America, who had this very florid, sort of surrealist kind of prose. Sure, sure, sure. And I ended up pitching myself somewhere in between dirty magic and magic realism. No, sorry. Uh, <laughs> magic realism and the other one. And it became Dirty Magic. Dirty Magic? Yeah. I like dirty it. realism and magic realism. I, if you haven't already named your autobiography Dirty Magic, I think that might be. Oh, uh, yeah. Title, that's a good though. choice. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll I get like in touch it. with my uh, publisher that doesn't exist yet. Yeah. <laughs> and do you remember the first poem you ever wrote? I do, actually. It's very embarrassing. I was going to say, I hope it's terrible. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember the actual text, but it was in high school. It was a poem about uh, breakdancing, because I had a bit of a crew going on in uh, Moynton High School. And, uh, it was, yeah, it was about uh, just us being a breakdance crew. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's better than me. I wrote terrible poetry about what I thought was teenage heartbreak, but was actually indigestion. So, oh, right. Um, well, that's the sort of poetry I write now, actually. <laughs> Or the heartbreak I'm sure stuff. you're better at it than me. <laughs> um, but you're not, and the other thing is, you're not just a poet, you do lots of things. I know I that sure you do. are a DJ. Yes. And a marriage celebrant. Yes. Yeah. And uh, how does that go? Do those kind of They complement each other very well, actually, yeah. because yeah. often I will marry them and then I'll DJ the reception. It's <laughs> great. And, uh, and do you write, I mean, do you write poetry for the reception or, the, or uh, for the wedding? Or? Yeah, I've written poetry for weddings and, and even without writing, I sort of bring a, a sense of poetry to uh, the ceremonies. Like, I, I don't think I ever would have become a marriage celebrant if I hadn't been a poet first. Yeah. Because that taught me the art of public speaking. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That's so interesting. Do you feel uh, that it's important to perform your poems? Like, you could just sit in a garret and write them, right? Yeah, it, it's important to me. I don't think it should be important for all poets because writing is a really lonely business. It's something you do in a room on your own. The beauty of performing my work is, is to, to get it out and it's kind of like an act of uh, instant publication and to get that feedback from an audience and to get that river that runs between you and the audience is yeah. very, very satisfying. And I started performing with a rock band and um, really? that was sort of... Like, like my rock and roll dream come true because I can't sing or play an instrument but suddenly I'm in front of a band and they're rocking out and it's awesome. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I, like the thing that would, I must admit, would terrify me about being involved in weddings at all is that it's such a high stress day, right? There's lots such, it seems like there's a That's lot true. that can go wrong. Do you, is there a, like a particular wedding where you thought, oh my God, I'm in trouble. Is there, are there funny wedding stories? I imagine there are funny wedding stories. Uh, yeah, people often ask me about my disaster stories and weddings, but I actually don't have that many. I think I've been very blessed with my clientele. I've Good. Maybe, I mean, because I'm quite easygoing, I like, like attracts like. I don't know. I've done some pretty wacky weddings, though. I did an Alice in Wonderland themed wedding. Ooh. It was the only wedding where I've been late, but by their request, because <laughs> I was the white rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I had to hide in the dunes and, and set up the PA and then get changed in my white rabbit costume <laughs> and wait for all the guests to arrive. And then when they're in position, I came out with my little pocket watch and saying, I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. And you were hiding in the dunes. It was a beach wedding, I guess. Yeah, it's amazing I didn't get arrested, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what 
could possibly go wrong? You're just hiding, dressed as a, sort of like a, a children's cartoon character, peering out of the dunes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, and you, and you, the other thing you do is make a podcast, right? Correct. Yeah, more than a stealing, more than a wheeling. More than a wheeling. <laughs> Speak about it. that Boston song. I love a good music pun. Yeah. Uh, yes, a podcast is a recent thing. Well, I started last year. We've had one season. And it sort of, it's in two parts. The first part, I sort of, uh, I interview creatives of all kinds of disciplines and just try to get inside their mind about their process. But also, I also ask my listeners to send me in creative prompts and then I write a poem based on those prompts and I do it on the show every week. Great. Sometimes I'll choose one prompt, sometimes I'll choose several. And a prompt could be anything. It could be a bottle of Maduri, sure. uh, a pot plant, a bucket. Uh, <laughs> and because uh, I find these... I've always found writing the prompts really helpful because when you sit down to write about anything, that can be paralyzing. But if someone throws some subjects at you, it sort of, it brings me into new worlds. And as I say on the show, these poems literally would not exist without the people who sent the prompts in. So invest the listener into the show as well. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Yeah, it's been a bunch of fun. Yeah, yeah. Would you do a, a poem for us now? I will, actually. I brought one along with me. So we, uh, we had our first live show um, for the podcast, and it was all themed around dogs. Uh, so shout out to the pets who won those awards before. <laughs> and so um, this is a poem, a short poem I wrote about dogs, and it's kind of inspired by the death of a beautiful uh, dog called B. So shout out to B. Dogs know the secret of the world. In the past, the present, and the future, I am a dog. Because why would you be anything else? Dogs know the secrets of the world and they try to deliver them to us all the time. We take the secret of the world and we gaze upon it, trying to decipher its code, but a mangy old tennis ball covered in slobbery spit is a difficult code to decipher. But we do not judge. We hold the very secret of the universe aloft and we fling it back into the world. And then the secret is delivered back to us by the most loyal of creatures. And that's why, to quote what I believe is the greatest song ever written by Australian band of phobes, dogs are the best people. They make us involuntarily smile. They make us voluntarily smile. They are always there at the opening of the door. They return us to the state of a child. In the past, in the present, and the future, in my most secret of secret worlds, I am always a dog. Because why would you want to be anything else? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Please thank Sean Wheeler.